Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar, Asian and Pacific Americans on the Bench, sponsored by the Historical Society of the New York Courts and the law firm of Meyer, Swazi, English and Klein in honor of Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. As judges and lawyers, we all know and understand that the public rightly looks to our courts above all institutions for fair and equal treatment. Without the public's confidence in our commitment and our ability to ensure equal justice under the law, the courts cannot function or carry out our mission of upholding the rule of law. And so I am grateful to everyone in the courts and the bar who is taking the lead and working with a sense of urgency to combat bias and discrimination in our justice system and foster a much needed dialogue on how we can ensure fair and equal treatment of everyone among us. And what better way to continue that critical dialogue than the excellent program we have on tap for you tonight, a program highlighting the professional journeys of our judicial colleagues in the Asian American Pacific Islander community and the unique experiences and challenges they encountered along the way reminding us of our nation's history of exclusion and discrimination against Asian Americans and addressing the recent disturbing surge in anti-Asian bias and violence. We are fortunate to have an extraordinarily distinguished group of speakers sharing their experiences and insights with us this evening. And I wanna take a moment to thank and recognize them starting with Randall Eng, former presiding justice of the Appellate Division Second Department, who enjoyed an absolutely trailblazing 34-year career in the judiciary, marked by so many historic firsts, including service as the first Asian American presiding justice of the Second Department. Acting Supreme Court Justice Lillian Wan, the moderator of tonight's panel discussion, who has been a strong and active president of the Asian American Bar Association of New York. Pamela Chen, United States District Judge for the Eastern District of New York, a courageous trailblazer on the federal bench. Anil Singh, Associate Justice of the Appellate Division First Department and the first Indian American to serve as an appellate judge in the New York State Courts, and acting Supreme Court Justice Toko Sarita, the first Japanese American judge in the New York State Courts, who now presides over our Queens County Human Trafficking Intervention Court. I want to thank each of them for their participation, as well as everyone at the Historical Society who made this program possible, starting with my dear, dear friend and predecessor, the Society's president, Jonathan Lippmann, the always supportive board members of the Board of Trustees, and executive director, Marilyn Marcus, and her terrific staff. And of course, I am especially grateful to all of you for tuning in and for demonstrating your commitment to diversity and inclusiveness, fair and even treatment of everyone among us, and equal justice for all. Thank you and best wishes for a meaningful program. Thank you, Chief Judge Di Fiore, for your inspirational, welcoming remarks and for your outstanding work in guiding our court system through the enormous challenges of the pandemic. I'm Randall Eng, and I'm the retired presiding justice of the Appellate Division Second Department. And it's my privilege to welcome you to this evening's program entitled Asian Pacific Americans on the Bench, Progress Made, Challenges Faced and Looking Forward, presented by the Historical Society of the New York Courts in collaboration with the Asian American Judges Association of New York and sponsored by the firm of Meyer Swazi English and Klein, which I now presently serve as counsel. I want to offer a special thanks to my colleague, Tom Levin, a senior member of the firm and a longtime trustee of the Historical Society. The Society, of which I am currently a trustee emeritus, has served to document and honor the extraordinary history of the courts of New York State 
and counts among its members an outstanding array of members of the bench and bar who are committed to presenting programs and publications toward that goal. I want everyone to consider becoming members and a visit to our website will introduce you to what we have done and where we are going. I also wish to commend the Historical Society for its strong public condemnation of the recent wave of anti-Asian bias, violence, and hate. Now, May was designated by act of Congress as Asian Pacific American Heritage Month in 1992. The history of the Asian American judiciary in New York begins only nine years prior to that date. And that occurred when I was appointed as a judge of the criminal court of the city of New York in 1983, the first person of Asian Pacific heritage to serve on any court, state or federal, in this state. My 34 years on the bench culminated with my service as PJ of the Appellate Division Second Department. So my career in the criminal court began with service in the summons part of Manhattan Criminal Court, and I even had the privilege of sitting once on the Court of Appeals by designation. And over those 34 years, I sat everywhere in between. Now, I think a brief historical overview is in order at this point. The first Asian Americans to become judges in the United States were from California and Hawaii. And it wasn't until the 1950s that that became a reality. John Aso, Japanese American, became a municipal court judge in Los Angeles in 1953. Delbert Wong, a Chinese American, was also a municipal court judge in Los Angeles County, appointed in 1959. Wilfred uh, Sukiyama became a member of the Hawaii Supreme Court in 1959, and Herbert Choi was named to the Federal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in 1971. And this gives you an idea of how recent a phenomena uh, Asian American judges have been uh, in the United States. Now, the numbers of Asian American judges in the Western states grew significantly in the years that followed, but the Eastern states lagged far behind. At the time of my appointment to the bench in 1983, the only Asian American jurist in the East was William Marotani, a judge of the Court of Common Pleas in Philadelphia, who took office in 1975. Doing some recent research, I found that the um, first Asian American to serve on the Boston Municipal Court was Richard Chen, appointed in 1989. Now, my own appointment to the New York City Criminal Court came about as follows. The mayor of New York appoints all 107 judges to that court. Ed Koch, who was the mayor in 1983, favored younger judicial candidates. In my year, nine of the 11 criminal court judges that he appointed were under the age of 40. And I, at that time, was 35. Mayor Koch liked prosecutors and former prosecutors. I happened to have been an ADA in Queens from 1972 to 1980. Mayor Koch liked to appoint from his own mayoral administration. At that time, I was Inspector General of the New York City Department of Correction. And also at that time, the city was attempting to build the White Street Jail, adjacent to the Tombs and Manhattan's Chinatown. The community was very unhappy with this and organized a protest march on City Hall, which exceeded 10,000 persons. When my proposed appointment to the court was announced, the mood changed and the turnout to witness the swearing in of the first Chinese American judge was so great that the ceremony had to be moved outdoors to the steps of City Hall. The jail was indeed built, and the numbers of Asian Americans in the New York judiciary began to grow shortly thereafter. And just to, to touch a few milestones, 
Uh, Judge Peter Tom was appointed just a year after me to the housing court. Judge Tom and Judge uh, Dorothy Chin Brandt, uh, two years later, became civil court judges, the first to be elected. And uh, the trend continued from that point. The persons asked me what my experiences in the criminal court were like being the first Asian American on the bench in New York State. I'm happy to report that they were positive, and they were positive for this reason. After several months in Manhattan Criminal Court, I was transferred to Queens, where I had the benefit of having served as an ADA in the 1970s. Therefore, I was a known quantity to the other judges, the DA's office, and to much of the defense bar. I probably had more issues being a very young judge. My colleagues at that time in the criminal court were some 25 to 30 years older than I. I had more problems with youth, perhaps, than as a person of color. Uh, I remember being mistaken as a, as a law clerk, a, a law secretary, an interpreter, all those other things, because I, I simply didn't fit the profile then of a, of a judge. But um, in fact, it was positive. So I, I have to credit my my service in the Queen's Courts as an assistant DA with helping me to um, uh, to break in. As to being a very young judge, I, I remember as a newly minted judge, I got my first judicial license plates. And I remember being stopped by a state trooper on Route 17 who informed me that he was going to give me a break. But that quote, just because your father's a judge doesn't mean you can speed. So I quietly thanked him for his advice. I did not correct him, and uh, I probably saved myself a uh, significant ticket. Fast forward, 1990, I was elected to the uh, state Supreme Court in Queens. Uh, Peter Tom, in the same year, was elected to the Supreme Court in New York County. As far as um, political activity is concerned, I was active in Queens politics before uh, I was um, I was nominated. Uh, I had been active in political organizations, and uh, interestingly enough, my uh, my parents' next door neighbor happened to be a um, a very influential Queens Democratic district leader. So things just don't happen; <laughs> they happen uh, sometimes by being in the right place at the right time. I was reelected in 2004. And uh, in 2007, I became the first Asian American administrative judge in uh, the New York system when I was named as the administrative judge of the criminal term in Queens Criminal Court. Fast forward again. In 2008, I was designated to the Appellate Division Second Department, becoming only the second Asian to serve on the Appellate Division. Peter Tom had been appointed some 14 years prior to that, serving in, um, in the first department. In 2012, I was designated by Governor Cuomo as presiding justice of the appellate division in the second department. And that covers my, my judicial career, which I believe was very fruitful and certainly uh, very, very satisfactory. And I'm uh, very proud of having been able to open doors for the judges who followed. I understand now there are 39 judges of Asian heritage in the New York courts now. And as I've observed, I don't know each of them personally. So I think that's an achievement too. There are so many judges of Asian heritage now that uh, we do not uh, have to um, be acquainted all at once. I am, I would be very pleased to, uh, to get to know them uh, further on. Now, the uh, program tonight is an interesting program and an exciting program. The moderator for this evening's program is the Honorable Lillian Wan. And she has a very distinguished pedigree as a, uh, as a judge, having served since uh, 2012 on the bench. Judge Wan was first appointed an interim civil court judge, and then she became appointed to a term on the family court. In 19, no, no, 20, 2018, you see I'm living in the past here, <laughs> but in 2018, 
she was um, the first Asian American woman to be uh, named as a judge of the Court of Claims. And if I'm not mistaken, she's only the second Asian American to be on the Court of Claims. I believe that Alex Jung preceded her uh, just by a year or two before that. And Judge Wan now sits as an acting Supreme Court Justice in Kings County. Her professional career began when uh, she was an executive counsel for the um, Administration for Children's Services, and uh, she was a court attorney referee and um, has had a distinguished career in the courts. And she also has served on many, many committees and organizations, including the um, the Asian American uh, Judges Association of New York, of which I am an early member, and also as the co-chair of the Advisory Committee on Judicial Ethics. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to my good friend, Justice Lillian Wan, who will introduce the other members of the panel. I, I thank you very much, and um, I wish everyone a, uh, a very fruitful webinar experience. Good evening, all. I am Judge Lillian Wan. Thank you for that kind and overly generous introduction, Judge Eng. Judge Eng is one of my mentors and I stand on his shoulders and hope to continue the work that he started. Before I give you the historical framework for our panel discussion this evening, I just wanted to show you a quick few photographs of me and my path. So that's me and Santa at uh, age three. So I'm the daughter of Chinese immigrants born in Flushing, Queens, and my parents wanted us to fit in. So they made sure that we did everything that everybody in America did. My mom made us corned beef and cabbage on St. Patrick's Day. She made cheesecake out of those Philadelphia cream cheese bars. We ate meatloaf regularly, and we went to the mall to see Santa. That is me, my mom and dad outside City Hall when I was first appointed to the bench by the mayor in 2012. That's me, my husband, two kids with New York City Assembly members after my Senate confirmation hearing for the Court of Claims 2018. So our program this evening is entitled Asian Americans on the Bench, the Progress Made, the Challenges Faced and Looking Forward. As Judge Eng mentioned, um, I am also a trustee of the Historical Society of the New York Courts, and this program was developed with them in their commitment to bring a better understanding to the public of this aspect of New York legal history. We felt it extremely important to put on this program at this moment in time where the rise in anti-Asian bias and violence over the last 15 months throughout the COVID-19 pandemic has challenged us as Asian Pacific Americans, yet again with the same issues that our communities have too often faced in this country. This violence reminds us of significant events and periods in our country's history where our communities were singled out and overtly discriminated against. I'd like to start for a few minutes with the story of Hong Yen Chang, the first Chinese American to be admitted as a lawyer in the United States. Hong Yen Chang graduated from Columbia Law School in 1886. At the time of his graduation, the New York State Bar required applicants to be US citizens, but the Chinese Exclusion Act barred him from citizenship. He was initially denied admission to the New York State Bar. The New York State Legislature subsequently enacted a law permitting him to reapply again to the bar. And then the New York State Supreme Court eventually admitted him to the bar on May 17, 1888. Hung Yen Chen then moved to California and he wanted to practice law in that state. And although he was a duly admitted member of the bar in another state, the California Supreme Court denied his motion to be admitted to the California State Bar on the ground that he was not a U.S. citizen, stating that, quote, a person of Mongolian nativity is not entitled to naturalization under the law of the United States, close quote. 
He passed away in 1926, never having been admitted to the bar in the state of California. But due to the work of the UC Davis School of Law's Asian Pacific American Law Students Association and Professor Gabriel J. Chin, Hung Yan Chang was posthumously admitted to the California State Bar on March 16th of 2015. As Professor Chin noted in a 2016 article in the UCLA Asian Pacific American Law Journal, Hung Yan Chang attempted to become a member of the bar at a time when the California Constitution of 1879 contained Article 19 entitled Chinese. The Constitution provided that the presence of Chinese quote, is declared to be dangerous to the well-being of the state and the legislature shall discourage their immigration by all the means within its power, end quote. In granting Hung Yen Chang posthumous admission to the California bar, the California Supreme Court stated, it is past time to acknowledge that the discriminatory exclusion of Chang from the state bar of California was a grievous wrong. It denied Chang equal protection of the laws. Apart from his citizenship, he was by all accounts qualified for admission to the bar. It was also a blow to countless others who, like Chang, aspired to be a lawyer only to have their dream deferred on account of their race, alienage, or nationality. And it was a loss to our communities and to society as a whole, which denied itself the full talents of its people and the important benefits of a diverse legal profession. The Chinese Exclusion Act prohibited the Chinese from immigrating to the United States and becomes, becoming citizens from 1882 to 1943. That's 61 years. And strict quotas continued to restrict Chinese immigrants until 1965. As Syracuse University's College of Law professor Mary Sito comments, Coronavirus anti-Asian racism also stems from the history of considering Asians as sources of disease and peril. And she notes that Asians are grouped together. Professor Sito also notes that the Chinese faced property discrimination in the exclusion era and that racial restrictive covenants were used against the Chinese and resulted in landlords refusing to rent to Chinese and realtors only showing them property in the most undesirable neighborhoods. Chinatowns, which many view as tourist attractions, were the only places that Chinese were permitted to live. Other Asians faced exclusion and incarceration throughout our nation's history. During World War II, from 1942 to 1946, Japanese Americans were imprisoned in internment camps, many forced to live in converted horse stalls. Anti-Asian violence and bias is not a new problem. In Detroit, 1982, Vincent Chin, a Chinese man, was beaten to death with a baseball bat when two white unemployed auto workers apparently mistook him for Japanese and blamed him for their own lack of work in the auto industry. Sikh Americans were killed after September 11, 2001. Balbir Singh Sodhi, the owner of a gas station in Mesa, Arizona, was murdered by a man who wanted revenge for the September 11th attacks. And he mistook Mr. Sodi as an Arab Muslim because he wore a turban and a beard. So it is against this historical backdrop of exclusion and discrimination that I frame our discussion about our pioneering Asian Pacific American jurists in New York. 95 years after the first Asian American was admitted to practice law in New York, we had our first Asian American jurist, the Honorable Randall Eng in 1983, appointed by Mayor Koch. And we didn't have our first elected Asian American judges until 1987, when both Peter Tom and Dorothy Chin Brandt, the first woman elected to judicial office, were both elected to the New York City Civil Court as Judge Ang was just mentioning before. And again, in 1990, Peter Tom and Randy Ang became the first Asian Americans to be elected to the New York State Supreme Court. And Doris Lynn Cohan was the first woman of Asian descent to be elected to the New York State Supreme Court in 2002. 
Toko Sarita, one of our esteemed panelists tonight, was the first Asian Pacific American woman to be appointed to the New York City Criminal Court in 2005. And as Judge Ang mentioned, we did not have our first Asian Pacific American on the New York State Court of Claims until Alexander Jiang's appointment in 2015. And when I was appointed to the Court of Claims in 2018, I became the first Asian Pacific American woman. 2018. Anil Singh, another one of our esteemed panelists, became the first Indian American to sit on an appellate court in New York when he was appointed to the Appellate Division First Department in 2017. This is not an exclusive list of firsts, and we continue to have our firsts and our onlys. As mentioned, today there are still only 39 judges of Asian Pacific American descent in New York State. That's about 3% of our state judiciary. 23 appointed, 16 elected, 37 of our judges are in New York City. In November 2020, Meredith Vaca and Hun Chin Kim became the first Asian Americans elected to judgeships in upstate New York. And there has never been an Asian American judge elected out of Brooklyn, Staten Island, or the Bronx. And this is in New York City, where Asians comprise 14% of the population. And there are currently no Asian Americans sitting in the appellate divisions of the second, third, and fourth departments. And there has never been an Asian American appointed to the Court of Appeals. With respect to the federal bench, some of our pioneering firsts include the following. Marilyn D. Go, retired United States Magistrate Judge for the Eastern District of New York. The first Asian Pacific American woman to serve as a judge in a federal court at the time of her appointment in 1993. Denny Chin was the first Asian American appointed as a United States District Judge in New York in 1994. Judge Chin was then appointed to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in 2010. Kiyo Matsumoto was the first Asian American woman to be appointed as a federal district judge in 2008. Lorna Schofield became the first Filipino American to serve as an Article III federal judge in the United States in 2012. Pamela Chen, another one of our esteemed panelists, became the first openly gay Asian American to serve on the federal bench when she was confirmed in 2013. Only 29 out of 677 Article III federal judges nationwide are of Asian Pacific American descent. That's about 4% of the federal judiciary. And there has never been an Asian Pacific American on the United States Supreme Court. So as president of the Asian American Judges Association of New York State, I keep all of these numbers and I look forward to the day when I don't have to use terms such as first or only when describing Asian Pacific Americans in the judiciary. As judges, while I know that we have made progress, there is still much work to be done. Tonight, I have the privilege of moderating a panel of amazing trailblazing jurists. The Honorable Pamela K. Chen, United States District Judge for the Eastern District of New York, the Honorable Toko Sarita, New York State Acting Supreme Court Justice and Presiding Judge of the Queen's Human Trafficking Intervention Court, and the Honorable Anil C. Singh, Associate Justice of the Appellate Division, First Department. So I'm going to start by asking each of our panelists to tell us about their background and what inspired them to become a judge. So why don't we start with you, Pam? All right. Good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'll start off with my parents. Uh, like Lillian's parents, uh, I, they were immigrants from China. Uh, so I'm a child of immigrants as well. Uh, but their backgrounds were perhaps unusual in that they came, believe it or not, during World War II to obtain graduate degrees and to study uh, at the University of Chicago, as it turns out, uh, which is where they met. 
Um, but due to the circumstances uh, of the communist takeover, my parents were essentially stranded here. So they became unintended uh, immigrants to this country and then eventually citizens. Uh, I grew up uh, in a suburb of Chicago called Skokie, which could explain why my Yiddish is actually far better than my Chinese, I'm sorry to say. Um, and then I went off to Michigan and to Georgetown. Uh, I grew up in a somewhat stereotypical family. I have a brother who's a lawyer and I have a brother who's a doctor. Uh, so some of these stereotypes, I guess, come from somewhere. Um, I then, after law school at Georgetown, went to big law, then I went to little law, and then I went to the DOJ in the civil rights division. Um, I think because my of my parents' experience uh, as immigrants who experienced discrimination firsthand, and obviously I witnessed that firsthand, um, I was always driven to go to law school by a desire to do public interest. So even though I went to big law for a while and I recommend it to law students all the time, um, I went to Arnold and Porter, um, I never thought I was going to stay or I knew I was never going to stay. And it was a question of what kind of public interest I would do. Now, I know there's some debate, but I considered the Civil Rights Division and federal government a form of public service. And I very uh, proudly worked there um, and I felt very honored to work there for seven years. Uh, but then I wanted to move to New York and wanted to stay at DOJ. So I made the ch only choice available to me at the time and joined the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, and there are two, obviously, in New York, uh, Eastern and Southern. Uh, happily, I ended up in Eastern, which is, a, I think, the best place for me. Um, I love our district, uh, which is obviously where I sit now. Uh, so I was a U.S. A USA for uh, almost 14 years uh, with a brief detour in the Division of Human Rights. Uh, luckily, um, life sort of has a way of circling back. I got to do criminal civil rights work and actually some uh, civil civil rights work while uh, as an AUSA and eventually got to be the chief of our civil rights unit, which I call the unit of one uh, or Liechtenstein, basically. So uh, I was the, the boss of me while I was in the civil rights mm -hmm. unit, um, but it was so rewarding. And I met Toko through that, actually, because I did a lot of human trafficking work. And so we became comrades in arms. Um, so the question is, what inspired me to become a judge? Um, I am not one of those people who you know, woke up as a as a child genius and said, oh, I want to be a judge one day. Uh, it evolved over time. And quite frankly, and this is something we'll talk about, um, I think given my background, which is sort of steeped in a sense of humility and uh, maybe not self-degradation, that's a little too harsh, but a lot of humility and your parents constantly telling you you could do better. Um, I just didn't necessarily think I was worthy. It didn't occur to me that I could be a judge, even though I thought I was a decent lawyer. Um, and it was really through uh, being in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Quite frankly, if I had never went there, I would never have become a judge. Uh, so a series, a series of co or a confluence of events serendipity intervened. Uh, and uh, I heard about how the process worked and that you basically apply. And we'll talk about that more later, but that you apply uh, at the time with Senator Schumer's uh, vetting committee. And so I did. And uh, one of my close friends at the U.S. Attorney's Office, Margo Brody, who's now our chief judge in the Eastern District, sort of led the way and all became illuminated to me. And so I don't know if I would say it was a question of being inspired so much as a lot of things fell into place at a time when I was wondering what to do next with my career. Uh, so I just got very lucky. And my central message is always going to be accept serendipity when it presents itself. And that's what happened for me. Um, and that's why I am where I am. Uh, so, D Daniel, I think I was supposed to tell you to queue up some photos. Uh, unlike Lillian, I was not an adorable child. Um, and so I think the photos of that I pulled uh, was this one, though you may think I look like a Girl Scout, <laughs> earnest as I am, it was actually at my uh, confirmation hearing or my Senate vetting hearing. So that's a seat that many have sat in beforehand. And I just look so happy to get there. That's the expression on my face. Um, and then the other pictures, we can go to the next ones, are um, my investiture and the giant gavel, which is a tradition in the Eastern District, passed down from the great Jack Weinstein uh, to every new judge. Uh, I no longer have it because I had to pass it on to the next judge after me. Uh, next couple of photos. Um, this 
this really should be the inspiration for me to become a judge because clearly I cannot be an academic because I look ridiculous in the, those graduation outfits, but that's speaking at a Fordham Law School graduation. I, I look preposterous. And then the final picture is really the reason I wanted to become a judge because you get to hang out <laughs> with amazing uh, Chinese lion dancing, uh, lion dancer um, uh, performers. Uh, and uh, this was an event uh, actually that Lillian and the Brooklyn um, Women's Lawyers uh, Group uh, organized and that I spoke at. And so uh, that's really re the, it's one of the highlights of my career. <laughs> I'm just kidding, actually. It was a wonderful experience. Okay. Great. Thank you, Pam. Pam. And you're being honest because you were actually honored at that event too, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and Neil. I, I was born and raised in, in India and I came to the States when I was 18. I never knew I was going to be a judge. I always knew I was going to be a lawyer from a very young age. Uh, I grew up in a, a middle class family, so we had essentially everything we needed. But I, I grew up in a time, uh, which still continues in India, where there was a real disparity between the people who have and the people who have not. And India was a chaotic society. And as a child, to make sense of it, I, I just thought that, that lawyers really understood what needed to be done, uh, could really make a difference in people's lives. And so from a young age on, I, I just knew in my, in my heart that I was going to be a, uh, a lawyer. Uh, I came to the States just on a scholarship. I was fortunate that uh, Lawrence University in, in uh, Appleton, Wisconsin, was, which is where Joe McCarthy is buried, uh, gave me a full scholarship, a four-year scholarship. And um, I probably would have gone back to, uh, to India at that time because I wasn't really happy in Wisconsin. I was asked things like, well, how do I ha always have a tan in winter, for example? And, and I happened to meet a woman who was going to Barnard and I came to New York and, uh, you know, I, I married her ultimately and, and I never left New York and never went back to India. Uh, after I went to law school, I knew that I was going to go into public service. I wanted to work for a judge because I wanted to be a litigator and I was very fortunate and offered a job by then civil court judge Alice Schlesinger who really is my mentor at this point and, and, and has helped me all the way through uh, my career. Um, I never, I, I committed for two years and then I worked for her for 15 years. And I was really ready at, after 15 years thinking, what am I gonna do next? And I thought, well, I'm gonna go into private practice. I'm gonna litigate. I just find the things that, that I wanna do. And she happened to have been um, uh, elected to Supreme Court. She called me into her office closed the door and I thought, oh boy, I must have done something wrong, but she's never closed the door on me. And she looked at me and said, I want you to run for my civil court seat. And I said, wow, I mean, you know, that's a compliment, but I don't know anything about this. I don't, I don't have any political contacts. I, and she said, don't worry about it. You have to go into a screening panel and I have six months left. I will take you around to all the political clubs. I will introduce you to everybody. And we started that process. I would trailer. Uh, my judge uh, is barely over five feet, but she would stride through the crowds and say, this is my law clerk and he's going to be a civil court judge. And it was rather embarrassing to me, this, you know, this, this presumptuousness of it, because, you know, um, at least in my culture, we don't sort of announce those kinds of things uh, in, 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 a, in a public forum in that way because uh, it's seen as arrogance, et cetera. Um, I, 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 when, when I decided I wanted to be a judge, I realized that, that what I had been doing for the last 15 years was really was, was helping people. And, and, and I would then have that ability as a judge uh, to do that. And there were parts of me that, that would think that, well, wouldn't that be great to be a judge? But since I didn't know what to do, I, I was never able to really articulate it to, to really anybody until someone articulated to me. And I was able to then uh, 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 sort of go through the process, which we will discuss later. There's some pictures, I think, that uh, that I had also submitted. So that's me on my left. Uh, my, my father, we, we were raised uh, as Sikhs. 
more culturally, so I, I had long hair, went through a turban tying ceremony. Uh, on the right is my brother, uh, who is also a lawyer. And um, we, uh, when we came to the States, I decided that I wanted to assimilate. And the way for a Sikh to assimilate, and it's, it's not uncommon for Sikhs when they go abroad, is to sort of cut their hair, stop wearing a turban, um, to, to sort of how we looked at it, sort of to become part of the mainstream. That's my brother and uh, me again. Uh, we, we grew up in a joint family. So I grew up with my, my cousins, my, my brother, my sister, my grandparents. And there's always been a really, really close relationship within our family amongst the cousins and, and, and the siblings uh, as a result of that. Now that I think is my favorite picture because we go from me being in the arms of my, of my father and to me holding my first born daughter, uh, which you know is probably the most incredible experience, a, a lot more meaningful to me than maybe even being a judge. I think uh, it was just, uh, I, 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 I can't describe how I felt and still feel when, when I look at that picture and look at my, my daughter now is 32. You know, I have two daughters. Uh, neither of them wanted to be lawyers. They're off doing very, very different things. And uh, this picture is of my, my close friend and colleague, Judge Owing, who sits on the first department with me. Uh, I, this is at his induction. So I was a judge, civil court judge for uh, one year at that point. And uh, we went through the process together. We, 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 we would talk about it. Once I got serious in the process, we would talk about it and strategize, and even though we didn't know anything about it, but we, we thought that we could, we, we, we would be able to work out that process. And uh, to this day, we still, we still do that. Even when it came, when we were appointed to the appellate division, we would, we would debrief each other as to how the various interviews went and what we thought was right about it and what was wrong, et cetera. I think that's really it. I, I don't really have much more to say on this issue. Thank you, Anil. How about you, Toko? I love hearing these stories. I wish we could spend the whole time uh, talking about our backgrounds, uh, but I know that we have a lot of uh, ground to cover. Anyway, um, I too am a child of immigrants. I was born in uh, Sapporo, Japan, and I came to this country when I was five years old. So maybe first photo. I was the only child of uh, two artists, right, who came to the U.S. to pursue their dream of uh, painting and living in New York City. And they actually spent about five years um, getting the money together to come to New York City because that's exactly where they wanted to be um, as artists. Uh, I grew up in an unconventional uh, household in Brooklyn. Uh, where my mom worked as a secretary and bought home the bacon so that my dad could stay home and paint and essentially perform the duties of what we now call a stay-at-home dad. Uh, he was also a fabulous cook. Uh, phone number two, please. So uh, this is a picture of uh, A.G. and Ayako. Uh, they were very fashion-forward, obviously, uh, but at the time that we lived in Brooklyn, there were very, very few Asians um, in the area. Uh, but interesting, interestingly enough, my best friend from third grade uh, onwards, and she's still a close friend um, to this day, uh, was a Chinese Ecuadorian girl uh, by the name of Celia. Anyway, photo number three. Most people I know would be surprised, uh, shocked even, to see me in a kimono, which I've only worn a handful of times in my life. Uh, but I chose this photo because it illustrates how so many of us as Asian Americans, whether first or fourth generation, uh, grow up with bicultural identities and straddle different cultures simultaneously, you know? And that's something um, that we could uh, talk about extensively uh, as well in terms of what we have all encountered. And I think that uh, people um, have very similar experiences uh, in that regard. Uh, in my case, even with my wild American ways as a teenager, um, I spoke Japanese at home, uh, was embedded in Japanese culture, and all my relatives still lived in Japan at that time. Uh, I would say I'm an example of living the American dream because of the opportunities that were afforded to me in the U.S., 
Um, and this may not have been possible had I grown up uh, as a girl in Japan. So I often wonder what the trajectory of my life would have been like um, had I stayed there and not come to the U.S. Uh, this also included uh, going to Vassar College on a full scholarship. Um, but I must say that my professional career has always centered around public service. I think that that's one of the things that um, all of us as panelists um, have in common. And the reason why I decided to go, go to law school was really to use law as a tool to affect social change. And for that reason, I chose to go to CUNY Law School. Um, after law school, I worked for several years as an appellate uh, criminal defense attorney for the Criminal Appeals Bureau of the Legal Aid Society. And then in 2000, I started a job as a court attorney and then as an executive assistant uh, for the administrative judge in Queens Supreme Court, uh, first for Stephen Fisher, uh, now deceased, and Leslie Leach. Um, in terms of inspiration uh, for becoming a judge, um, I would also say that that was never uh, my intent in going to law school. And um, it was not something that I thought about uh, previous to uh, somebody mentioning to me uh, while I was uh, working in Supreme Court that there were very, very few Asians on the bench. So that was a big consideration for me. Uh, in terms of my decision to uh, become a judge, especially because I was working in Queens at the time and there were so few Asian American judges then. Uh, I was appointed in 2005 um, by uh, Mayor Bloomberg and I sat in Brooklyn Criminal Court until 2008. And then when the opportunity presented itself to go to Queens and take over for a court part that Judge Fernando Camacho had started working with um, victims of trafficking, I jumped at that possibility. So I've been there for um, many years now, since 2008, and um, have worked at the Queen's Human Trafficking Intervention Court, which is one of the oldest and largest courts in this country to identify and provide alternatives to incarceration for trafficking survivors and sex workers. Uh, one of the things that um, Judge Chen said earlier um, in terms of life, you know, has a way of circling back is, is, is definitely true. Uh, I have been involved in women's issues for a number of years, but uh, felt that uh, my professional career and my, um, my political interests really did not uh, dovetail uh, until such time that I was able to start doing this work. And um, I must say that even though I've been acting Supreme Court Justice since 2014, um, I've chosen to stay in criminal court because of my dedication to this issue in terms of being a problem-solving court judge and really being able to have an impact on the lives of uh, countless people who have come before me. Um, so that's it. Thank you. You want to tell us about this photo real quick? Oh, yeah. So before I forget, um, <laughs> um, this this court was the subject of a full length documentary called Blowing Up, uh, which came out in 2018. And if you have access to Amazon Prime, uh, you can see it for free. So thank you. Thank you, Toko. So, um, Toko, you were speaking a little bit about what the landscape was like when you became a judge in 2005. Um, Neil, I think you became a judge in 2002. So what was it like then in 2002? Uh, in, in 2002, there were no South Asian judges. I mean, it was just uh, so I knew if I that I was the first. And my view of being the first was I didn't want to be the last. So I sort of felt like, you know, you can't screw this up. You got to do a good job because they're not going to appoint others or elect others if, if, if the first screws up. And so I sort of felt that I, I needed to keep that door open for others to to come through. And, and I'm happy to report that that we have made progress in that area slowly, but we have made progress. And uh, how about you, Pam? You were appointed in 2013. What was the landscape like? 
So that was the tail end of Obama's first administration. And I have to say, I'm the lucky beneficiary of the fact that Obama wanted to play catch up in terms of diversifying the federal bench. And he nominated and got confirmed more Asian and more gay candidates than all other presidents combined up to that point. So again, I was the lucky beneficiary of that. Now, in terms of where things are now, the Biden administration obviously similarly has the same values. And I apologize, I have a fire truck outside my apartment. Um, but I think they're diversifying further in terms of experience and clearly looking more for legal aid lawyers or, or defenders, because I was a former prosecutor, right? And so I've seen, at least in the nominations that have uh, come out lately, that they're trying to diversify in terms of experience and getting away from the model of prosecutor, you know, corporate attorney, that kind of thing. Right. And Togo, did you want to say something else about that? Because I think that you were the first Japanese American when you were appointed in 2005. Uh, that's correct. Um, I would say, I, I, I would note that in 2013, we started the um, Asian American Judges of New York organization. And at that time, there were only 1.8% Asian judges uh, statewide. So I would say it was about maybe 20 judges then. Uh, when I first started in 2005, there were very, very few judges. Um, you know, we could count them um, on one hand, basically. And, um, you know, Judge Ang was really a mentor and a source of, of support for so many of us. But it was very, very, very small numbers of Asian American judges. So even today, Asian Pacific Americans comprise about 8.3% of the population in New York State and approximately 14% of the population in New York City. And Asian Pacific Americans are also the fastest growing minority group during the past decade in both New York State and nationwide. So yet we're only 3% of the state judiciary and 4% of the federal judiciary. So what do you think explains this underrepresentation of Asian Americans? Uh, well, first in the state judiciary, and then Pam, um, you can speak to the federal judiciary. Um, Anil, do you wanna start us off? Sure. Uh, I, I think it's lack of, at least for everything I preface my remarks is really from the elected process, because I don't know how the appointed process works. And I came through the elected, and I, and I think there are some benefits to come through the elected process, um, in part because it's, it's done more in the open, I think, as opposed to uh, appointed process where there's a closed room and you have absolutely no idea who's at the table. Uh, it, what I see is sort of a lack of engagement in the political process. And this is just like grassroots engagement of lawyers, young lawyers um, uh, who want to be judges. I, I, as a young lawyer, I didn't know I wanted to be a judge. That path just opened for me. What I noticed is when I was running for Supreme Court starting in about 2009, that there were so many young lawyers, members of political clubs who had appeared before me and, 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 and they were ambitious. And that's... And I noticed that many of them did as I, as I went through the, the process over about three years to become an elected Supreme Court judge, that these folks were getting were, were becoming uh, civil court judges because of their involvement in the political process. And and that's what I've stressed at every panel discussion I've had is that you, you, you need to be engaged in the political process. I did. I was not engaged in the political process at all. I actually came out of a screening panel before I even knew what a political club was. Uh, but I was able to uh, maneuver it because I was the first, and so I, I, I had some uh, advantages in that. But now I think it's really important to be in, to be to be engaged. And I think we're seeing more of that these uh, these days. Um, I would say in the past ten years than previously, because I remember having conversations with Judge Ang, who you know would encourage um, attorneys um, to you know be part of the political process, especially because there were very very few uh, Asian American judges being elected uh, to Supreme Court um, at that time. I would say maybe ten years ago there were many more. Uh, Asian judges uh, being appointed, you know, through the appointed process. Uh, I think that there are two things at issue here. One is a pipeline, right? And then the other is um, those that are in control of the selection process. 
So in terms of the pipeline, uh, there's also a lack of attorneys uh, involved in the public sector, right? Many attorneys um, who get through law school are interested in going into, you know, the private law firms, going into corporate law, et cetera. And so that's one um, deficit that I see. Uh, the other one is certainly, um, as we were talking about before, engagement in the political process. And I think that that's something that happens over time. And now, you know, many more uh, attorneys are becoming involved in that way. So I think that that's a positive thing. So, yeah, so I just want to reinforce exactly or second what uh, Judges Sarita and Singh said. It's politics, pipeline, and then I would add in some self-censorship, this notion that mm -hmm. I don't think I should be the one and then not seeking the help you need. Now, the politics for f the federal system is slightly different because we never get elected, right? And so the key is to have people who are in political positions to get you both referred, then nominated by the president, and then confirmed by the Senate if you want to be an Article Three judge. And I came across a statistic that sort of astounded me, that even though Asians are 6% of the population nationwide, we only have 0.9%. Uh, we only have 0.9% of federal, state, and local elected officials who are AAPI. And so we're not at the table in a sense. We're not the ones who are referring uh, us for whether it's elected office or confirmed Senate positions. Um, uh, and that's one issue. And then the one about pipeline is also that we don't like I and I can speak to this somewhat more locally because Albany is one of our bit is a, an amazing bar association in New York. And I remember one time when under Obama, they were actually looking for a candidate uh, to fill, I think, an Article Three position. And we just had nobody lined up, nobody who had expressed an interest and no one we had vetted. And that was really a loss. And so I think that kind of pipeline is critical. And I think people don't realize it exists, but you have to reach out to your local bars. New York is unique, as is California and other metropolises. But if you're like in the middle of the country, mm -hmm it's a lot more difficult to find those networks. So you have to sort of look beyond to organizations like NAPABA, which is a, a National Asian Pacific American Bar Association to get support and help. And then the third one is this feeling that somehow why me, you know, and if I was so good, they would pluck me out of obscurity. It doesn't work that way. You have to self promote and you have to feel sort of comfortable uh, putting your hat in the ring as they say. Uh, you know, one of my colleagues said to me recently that maybe we should go out to elementary schools and, and have bumper stickers and that say, why not me? And hand them out to everybody in kindergarten. Why not me? Right? right. So it happens at a young age. Right? Well, the Kamala Harris t-shirts, I think, are brilliant, right? They say, my vice president looks like me. And it's like so perfect. Yeah. So uh, I now uh, want to turn to some of the challenges uh, you may have faced along the way. So what are some of the stereotypes about Asian Americans and have those stereotypes had an impact on the way you are perceived as a jurist and in what way? Uh, Toko? Huh, stereotypes, yeah. Well, I think some of the stereotypes around um, Asian Americans are, first of all, the sense that we're always a foreigner, right? Um, we're forever the foreigner. Being is really conditional, meaning it doesn't matter how many years you've been um, in the United States, what generation you are, how well you speak English. Um, there's always a sense of not really belonging. I think that's one uh, thing. I think that um, the model minority myth is also something that um, we uh, experience a lot in a lot of different ways. And you know what strikes me as um, very ironic about that is that you know the concept of Asian is so broad and over inclusive and includes so many different nationalities um, that don't really. Um, you know, there are so many different types of experiences, right, that different uh, cultures um, and, and different people face. And so the model minority myth does not really um, apply to all the, quote, Asians, right, that we're thinking of. And so that has um, 
been an issue as well. Um, also, invisibility. I think that you know because of our um, because of how our experiences have been shaped in this country, uh, we still suffer uh, from invisibility as a, as a group of people. And that makes it very, very difficult in terms of getting our um, issues heard. So those are some of the things that come to mind. O'Neill? Um, you know, I guess I, I haven't sort of felt the stereotype. I, I was telling um, uh, before the program started, uh, uh, Judge Eng, that my friend Judge Oing is always mistaken for Judge Eng. And, and Judge Oing is also mistaken for me uh, when he's with his son on the street and we don't look anything alike. So I, I think that we're sort of lumped together in, in, in this pot. Anyway. Uh, but what I think I would rather look at is, is how has that made me on the bench? Um, I, I, I think that what I've always tried to do is, is uh, really try hard to listen to what people are saying, to be, to be open to views, to write decisions that 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 take everything into account, um, sort of to, to to deal with sort of the stereotypical stereotypical things of 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 what they perceive of of or what that the outside community perceives of of who we are to to show that we're sort of or at least from my perspective that I'm better than that I can that I can do this job uh, and I can do the job well hopefully. Uh, so, Lillian, I just want to add one thing. I think that women, especially women uh, of color, have a double whammy, which is it's both the gender thing and also the minority thing. Uh, I will tell you, when I was going through the process, um, you get rated, obviously, by the ABA and then also the New York City Bar Association. And um, uh, Toka and I were actually just talking about this in connection with the Court of Appeals, and I'll let her talk about that. But when I was going through my own process, I was actually told by someone who deals with candidates all the time that I was likely not going to get a highly qualified rating from the ABA. And sure enough, he was right. And he said they never give it to women minor women who are minorities. And when they explained to me why they wouldn't give me highly qualified, they said it's because I'd never handled a civil jury trial, which would seem ludicrous to me because I'd handled so many criminal jury trials. I mean, I was a very experienced prosecutor at that point. So I don't know if lurking in there was some, if you will, sort of racist or gender based, but it it did happen. And when he told, had predicted it would happen and then it happened, I was quite surprised. So as a judge, I cannot sort of identify a moment when someone said something to me or even hinted something that was racist or even gender sort of biased. But my law clerks will say to me all the time that they don't think that certain litigants, and it tends to be older white males, would speak to me that way if I were an older white male. So however you want to parse that, I think it's true. We do, I do get mansplained probably more, and I, and I don't mean any disregard to any of the men who are participating or watching, but it has happened to me probably, and I don't have any study to, to back this up, but at least anecdotally, I would say it happens more to my female colleagues and it certainly happens more to my female colleagues of color. Thank you. So there has obviously been this rise in anti-Asian hate and violence since the outset of this pandemic. Have any of you experienced any discrimination or harassment based on your Asian or South Asian heritage, either on the bench or in your personal life or someone close to you? Something that I have been experiencing recently in terms of, you know, how I have res been responding to the rise in anti-Asian violence. And um, I continue to take the subways every day. There was one um, period where I wound up donning a cap in addition to my sunglasses and masks so that I could hide my identity uh, when I was going um, to the subway. And so there is, um, you know, a certain level of fear uh, that has arisen um, because of what has happened uh, in recent times. And um, I did note that um, there was a study that said out of the 3,800 incidents of um, anti-Asian, you know, violence within the past year, 70% uh, of the victims have been women. And so I think that 
there is a relationship between uh, race and gender, and in part because of the way uh, that you know Asian women um, are seen uh, as far as being. Um, uh, as far as being considered meek and docile uh, as, you know, part of the stereotypes. And I think that that gets back to, you know, some of the conversation that was taking place in terms of um, the existence of implicit bias, you know, that I have not been subject to uh, express instances of, of bias as an Asian woman, but I think that, you know, as far as stereotypes that exist of, uh, you know, Asian women being more meek or, you know, more subservient, et cetera, that that kind of plays out uh, in certain instances. Anil, did you want to comment about that? Um, well, just briefly, I, I was, uh, for the first time in my life, I was uh, accosted, uh, but this was before COVID, coming out of Penn Station, and I was told I don't belong here. And I was trying to back away, and the guy, the person came up to me and said, don't worry, I'm not going to pop you. And I thought to myself, well, I guess that's good, <laughs> you know. And I, and he sort of talked for a couple of minutes and, uh, you know, about jobs being taken, et cetera, and, and then I left. And I attributed that to mental illness. Uh, but since the pandemic, I, I, I don't think mental illness really explains what's going on with the levels of, of, of uh, racism there is towards uh, Asian Americans, and and it's it's really it's it's really troublesome. I I, I you, you know part of your question is is well, where do we go from here? How do we deal with it? And I, and I I don't have a good answer to that. I you know honestly I you know engagement in the political process. I, mean, I don't know. I you know we have a vice president who's half Indian and half black. Uh, I guess that's a good thing, but you know, I, I don't know how to. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I I don't know what the future holds. Thank you, Anil. Pam, you want to try with your volume again? Yeah. So I don't know where I cut out, but I was uh, saying that I have a fear about getting on the subway, and I know obviously Toko is feeling differently. But um, I think my fear was confirmed in some way when I was picking a jury about a month ago for a trial. And one of the potential jurors, a young Asian woman, said, I don't want to serve uh, because I'm so terrified to take the subway. And this was day two of jury selection. So I said, well, how did you get here the first day? And she said, well, I took the train, but I was so anxious that basically I ended up having to take some anti-anxiety meds afterwards. And the second day I took an Uber because... I just didn't want to go through that again. And it costs like $50, as everyone can imagine, to come from Queens. And so to me, it was a visceral example of how widespread this fear is uh, amongst Asian Asians, and I think Asian women in particular, when it comes to certain places in New York that one would find themselves and where you might feel trapped, which is a subway, right? And I don't think it was irrational. And thankfully, the parties agreed that we should not force her to sit on the jury and have to come to court every day. But I think it's real. Uh, and I've had a law clerk who actually experienced a very hateful incident uh, in Virginia uh, while walking his dog. So um, it's enough that when it touches you that you know that it, it exists. Thank you, Pam. T Sorry, Toko, were you about to say something else? No, um, just to follow up on yeah. this, as as horrific as the instances of anti-Asian violence have been. And, you know, I, I cannot forget about the six Asian women um, working in massage parlors who were murdered recently, right, in Atlanta, and um, just the implications of that. But I think one of the positive things that has come out of all of this is um, the level of discussion about anti-Asian history and anti-Asian discrimination. So it has become a teaching moment in some ways in terms of a broad understanding of what Asian American history is all about. And this is something that we have not seen up until now. And so I'm just hoping that, you know, as a result of this, um, there is more awareness uh, that is brought about in terms of our experiences. And you're hearing um, more people's voices, right, uh, being heard on this issue of, you know, the Asian American experience. I think that that's really important.
I mean, at the risk yes, of stating the obvious, it's always that undercurrent of otherness or foreignness that um, everyone's referred to. We're always perceived when things get tough as somebody other than American, uh, even though many of us obviously uh, were born here and obviously consider ourselves, of course, Americans. So uh, it's, it's, it is a historical problem, sadly. And it mm-hmm. bubbles up every once in a while when there's a crisis, Vincent Chin or something right. like that. So the issue of diversity is really at the forefront at this moment. And I'd like to hear from all of you, why does why does diversity matter? And particularly, why does it matter in our judiciary? So um, I and I'm going to preface this by saying I apologize because I'm going to read something lengthy to you, but I think it's really important. Uh, so the two main reasons, I think, at least, is that one is it does instill public uh, confidence, uh, public confidence about the judiciary when it reflects the people that we are serving. And then the second one is, and this is something Justice Sotomayor said, and I remember thinking that she was right, although it wasn't obvious to me, that somehow we inform not only the public's view because we have this position of some authority and sort of a, a way to broadcast certain policies or ideas because of what we do, but also you inform your colleagues. And so I'm going to read, and I do regret it's a little long, but I think it so brilliantly illustrates his point. Um, Justice Sotomayor's um, dissent from the Schuett case, S-C-H-U-E-T-T-E, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It was a Supreme Court decision relating to um, whether they could overturn a voter mandate, uh, basically, or change to the Michigan Constitution, which prevented their universities uh, from considering race in their admissions. And so the decision was is that uh, the Supreme Court couldn't overturn that. And it was up to the voters to decide uh, how their state would spend, uh, would um, fashion their admissions policies. And so Justice Sotomayor wrote this brilliant um, dissent in which she starts by, which she says, amongst other things, my colleagues are of the view that we should leave race out of the picture entirely and let the voters sort it out. It is a sentiment out of touch with reality, one not required by our constitution, and one that has properly been rejected is not sufficient to resolve cases of this nature. And this is where I think her unique sort of experience as an immigrant, uh, as a Latina, really informs her view and in some way informs, I think should inform the view of her colleagues and the public. She then writes, race matters. Race matters in part because of the long history of racial minorities being denied access to the political process. Race also matters because of persistent racial inequality in society, inequality that cannot be ignored or that has produced stark socioeconomic disparities. And this is the part that got me. And race matters for reasons that are really only skin deep, that cannot be discussed any other way, and that cannot be wished away. Race matters to a young man's view of society when he spends his teenage years watching others tense up as he passes, no matter the neighborhood where he grew up. Race matters to a young woman's sense of self when she states her hometown and then is pressed, no, where are you really from, regardless of how many generations her family has been in the country. Race matters to a young person addressed by a stranger in a foreign language, when he doesn't, which he does not understand because only English was spoken at home. Race matters because of the slights, the snickers, the silent judgments that reinforce that most crippling of thoughts, I do not belong here. In my colleague's view, examining the racial impact of legislation only perpetuates racial discrimination. This refusal to accept the, accept the stark reality that race matters is regrettable. The way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to speak openly and candidly on the subject of race and to apply the Constitution with eyes open to the unfortunate effects of centuries of racial discrimination. As members of the judiciary tasked with intervening to carry out the guarantee of equal protection, we ought not sit back and wish away rather than confront racial inequality that exists in our society. 
It is this view that works harm by perpetuating the facile notion that what makes race matter is acknowledging the simple truth that race does matter. And that to me is just such a brilliant example of why it does matter, why diversity matters, that her view is so personally and poignantly expressed, I think, does inform her colleagues' views and I think the public's views. And so I think we as members of the judiciary sort of have an obligation to keep this in mind when we dispense our duties. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't change how we rule in a particular case. We always have to follow the law. But this kind of rhetoric and discussion about policy as it's intertwined with the law is really very important. It's vital, I think, to us functioning uh, as a very important check on the majority sort of overtaking the minority and in imposing its views on the minority all the time. So that's my why diversity matters lecture, my soapbox. No, thank you, Pam. I, I, would, I would add that when I think of judicial diversity, I think of, you know, we're a multicultural society, at least in New York City, I hope. Um, and it's really important that the judiciary is representative of that, of, of the entire multicultural society, because when members of the community appear before a black or Hispanic or Asian judge, they don't expect that the judge, because they're black or Hispanic that or Asian, that the judge is going to rule in their favor. But but I think that they feel that they will be heard, and 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 it goes to this idea, this concept of, of due process, a fair trial, and 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 that's all I think that that is being requested, and and that's what a a diverse judicial uh, uh, community uh, gives. Uh. That's right. And also, you want a judicial bench that is reflective of the community, right? That it serves. And if you have a, you know, um, uh, if you have a population of people of color and all white judges, then obviously there is going to be perceived uh, an imbalance. And a lot of the people appearing in court may not feel like they are getting a fair shake, right? So um, perception matters, uh, representation matters, and you know these are all issues that go to uh, diversity, right? And it's something that we are sorely lacking, not only as um, Asian Americans, but as uh, people of color being represented on the bench. So it is a real issue. And I would just add that it sort of comes home to me in, in the first department, and, and I imagine the second department too, they have the photographs of all the judges going back to the inception of the appellate mm -hmm. division. And it is so interesting to see how that's changed over the years. At one time, all white Irishmen, it appears to me, at least from their names, and, and that has really changed to the, the pictures of, of the first department. Now, women coming in, and then uh, uh, other minority uh, members, Peter Tom, the first, and, and many others after that. And it's just a, it's, it's a, that's the, the, the picture that, that says the thousand words, you know, of, of the changes in our society. Yeah. Thank you. So part of the point of our program tonight is uh, to look forward. And we know we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. So we started talking a little bit about pipeline issues before. Uh, do we think that a sufficient pipeline of qualified Asian Pacific American candidates exists? And if not, what do we think should be done to create or build on this pipeline? So I think following up on some of our earlier comments, I would say not yet. Um, and I think some of the reasons have been identified. I think a lot of Asians don't go into public interest. And obviously, so we're talking about jobs that don't pay nearly as well as the private sector. Um, and then I think I think maybe culturally, we're often afraid to ask for help. I know that was true when I went through my own process, that I waited to the last minute before I even let anyone know that I was thinking about applying because I was embarrassed, you know, a bit feeling like, why should I think I should get this? And I think people have to sort of get out of that mindset and seek the help they need. Now, there are many pipeline programs, and I do want to put in a plug for a few, because we should start them much younger than law school. We should start them in high school, quite frankly, and expose them to a very different sort of reality than they may be growing up in. 
you know, especially if they're children of immigrants who don't sort of have a lawyer in the family or even a college graduate in the family. So we have actually a Sotomayor um, internship program that has high school, college, now in law school, where we bring them into our chambers in the summer, both state, many of the people I'm sure watching here today are probably participating judges um, and federal judges. And then we have a you know educational component. There's just the beginning, which is it's out of Chicago, another national um, organization that works with law students and younger, and they start them in high school with mentorships. Uh, and NAPABA even, like we just, our judicial council, decided to sponsor a scholarship for an internship for the summer. So there are programs, you just need to find them. Or if you live in a place which isn't like New York or California, and they're harder to find. You got to start one. If you're a member of your Asian Bar Association, you should start one. It's really easy to do. Just take someone into your chambers uh, or, you know, hook up with your bar association. But I, I sort of think the bar associations have to really sort of get into the act and help sort of start the kid, start kids young, thinking that this is a reality that they can attain. There's no reason they can't. Very true. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things that we are realizing is that we have to start uh, reaching out to young people at an earlier age. And I think that what Pam is saying uh, in terms of, you know, um, doing outreach to not just law students, but, um, you know, Asian American kids in high school and in colleges and even before that um, is really important. And one of the things that um, Pam had mentioned, uh, it, which is true and, and, and something that is um, a challenge for us to deal with as Asian American judges and Asian Americans in general is, you know, what are the ways that our um, cultural upbringing, right, impinges on our ability to, you know, be more proactive or, or forceful. And it's not in any way a uh, blame the victim type uh, scenario, but, you know, just uh, really figuring out um, what is it that that prevents us right from fully expressing ourselves uh, in terms of some of the cultural values that we've been raised with? Um, and I think about, um, let's say, you know, cultural humility or being very humble or um, not wanting to make a big stink about yourself. You know, the, the whole idea of individualism that is central to, let's say, American cultural American culture is really not perceived as a positive thing, right, in a lot of like Asian cultures. So, you know, how do we kind of overcome that? And I think that this is where, um, you know, many of us who are judges and also have experience of as lawyers can really help uh, in terms of uh, dealing with, you know, some of these things that come up. Anil? You know, the only thing I would, I would add, um, I, I some years ago when I was um, in at 60 Center Street, I was asked to speak to a class of I think fifth or sixth graders, and they came to my courtroom and you know they all had their questions and 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 they asked me about how I became a judge and et cetera et cetera and 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 I tried to hopefully instill in them at least one or two of them something about the law and why being a lawyer, considering being a lawyer, uh, would be would be something that's worthwhile, uh, uh, and and start thinking about it at a young age, and and, and you know, and and that's where I think it go, it starts much much earlier. I think it's in elementary school in the South Asian community. Um, there's a at least less so now, but but lawyers were never highly regarded. Uh, your parents wanted you to be doctors or accountants and, you know, all that kind of good stuff. Um, I mean, that's, and I imagine that in other Asian communities, it's, 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 it's similar. But I've noticed the second generation South Asian, uh, uh, there, there are many more lawyers now. And, and uh, so I think that those sort of cultural ideals are, are changing. And but but more can be done, I think, and, and, and really at, 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 at when the kids kids are young at, 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 in their formative years um, to, to to make a difference. 
Mm. I want to add something to what Anil was saying, because he, it, what he just said made me think of it, too, is that there's so many opportunities to go and meet high school students or even younger. I know you guys probably do the same thing. We bring elementary school students into our courtrooms all the time, or we, the circuit, the Second Circuit, for example, has a big uh, effort on Law Day where judges go out to the high schools in New York City and meet with classes. So there are for lawyers and for judges, there's so many ways to connect with kids and get them much younger and volunteer for these organizations. I, for example, drag my law clerk to be on the board of the Sotomayor internship organization. But I think there's so many of you out there that I suggest you do it because it's so satisfying when you see these kids very eagerly and hungrily sort of like gravitate towards or eat up all this sort of knowledge they're getting when they see this other reality. And it can be life changing. It really is life changing for so many kids who don't have the same advantages that I think that many of us did. And so um, I urge you to go and do that. Um, also for judges, I've started going out to law schools to you know, meet with law students, specifically meeting with the affinity groups. And obviously the gay and lesbian groups are also a, a place where I like to go and visit those students because I think they too feel overlooked at times and are even, especially if they're Asian and gay, there really is a lot going on there. And I think somehow it makes a big difference to to see someone, someone who succeeds in some by some measure with the same kind of profile in a culture that it isn't always so accepting. And so I urge everybody also, judges, just to get out there and talk to as many students as you can. And in the process, you find some very good law clerks, I will say that, <laughs> very selfishly. No, and I would agree with us starting in the schools because I think it's really important for kids to see that we are all just normal human beings, right? Even when I was an attorney practicing before judges, I had no idea how the judges got there. I thought they were sent from God. I had no idea, right? So these kids really don't, they don't understand that judges are just normal people, right? Trying to do their best. So maybe you can all join me and we can make those bumper stickers that say, why not me? And we can hand them all out together to kindergartners. So, um, Anyway, you're saying the mayor isn't God. I'm very disappointed. Okay. <laughs> just a person too, right? <laughs> so historically, what has the relationship between Asian American communities and uh, the American political process been? And how has the changing dynamic contributed to more Asian Americans in the legal profession? Hmm. And so yeah. I just want to, again, talk about the fact that there's only 0.9% of the federal, state, or local officials who are AAPI. So that's like the data point we have right now. And that's actually after some improvement. So we have a very, very long way to go. Now, I will say I personally understand why people don't run for office or run to become a judge because it's not for the faint of heart. I mean, even going through the appointment process is difficult. So I think the question is, and I have no answer for this one, how do you convince Asians that they should seek elected office at whatever level? I think it's happening more and more, right? I think as they see more and more people who are doing it successfully, um, whether it's locally or in the Senate, like I think I've seen so many, I hate to say this, but COVID has has been very illuminating in, in terms of how many minority women are running major cities, which mm. I think is just fascinating. Every time you see some city when they talk about COVID, it's often a, like Chicago. I mean, I'm from Chicago. I hadn't really realized that it was run by a black female there. I think it's terrific. Or Georgia, similarly, right? And so I think um, I think we're seeing it more and more, and maybe that will inspire people. But otherwise, I think they maybe need some sort of support from the bar associations or whatever it is to sort of get the courage and sort of the network to do it because you can't run alone, right? And you really need a very strong support network. Toko? Um, I also think this is fairly new, right? When we were talking about the need to, um, I don't know, create awareness and, and encourage the younger generations or encourage kids, um, I thought back to um, our respective or mutual immigrant experiences, right? So there are two things at play here. One is access and privilege. I mean, you know, 
in my experience, I was able to um, uh, develop professionally through education, right? But I think like, for example, um, many immigrants, if they have parents that don't speak the language or, you know, if they have not had traditional access to, you know, different institutions or think that these institutions are, are um, available, right, for them as, um, uh, you know, um, workers or, or staff people or whatever, it makes it that much more difficult. And I think that privilege is also an aspect of it as well. You know, if you come from a very middle class affluent society, uh, you do have different types of access that you don't have, you know, if you're coming from a working class background, etc. So these are also things that we have to uh, keep in mind. But in terms of the political process, um, I think that more, definitely the younger generation are starting to understand that, you know, there is an avenue for them. Anil, did you want to add anything? I, I don't really have much more to add. I, I would just, just sort of echo what's being said. I, there, there's, I think there's been a real change in, in at least, now I focus when I hear a South Asian person in Congress, I mean, there's pride. I, for, me, for me, there's real pride. I mean, I just, you know, and 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 um, um, that's increasing, and I think that's being seen. But but with respect to, I think the affinity or the so-called affinity bar associations, SABNI and, and the Asian bar associations, they have to be more involved in this process to to engage, to get people into the legal profession, and then to to move them towards if, if they're interested in becoming judges, to to give them that support network, you know, to, to do that. Yeah, you know, um, you know, Pam, what you were saying about this 0.9% is really quite staggering, right? And even when we look at New York City, like I said, 14% Asian American, right? And when you look at how many public officials we actually have, um, <laughs> not not really too many, right? You can count them on one hand. Um, uh, may I exercise a point <laughs> of personal privilege? Yes, if you can, this Randy. Very intently and. Um, I just want to say one quick word about my home borough of Queens. And remember that I uh, was a Queens Supreme Court justice, and um, I'm very proud of having been in the Queens courts. Queens uh, has elected an Asian American woman as a member of Congress. Absolutely. Grace Meng is very prominent on the national scene now. You saw her mm -hmm. um, uh, next to the president when the anti-Asian hate bill uh, was signed into law. We have uh, from Queens uh, a state senator who is previously the citywide elected controller of the city of New York. We've had several assembly members. We've had several uh, city council members. And um, from Queens, I was the an administrative judge as well as the presiding justice of my court. This didn't all happen accidentally. <laughs> it happened because right. of... Uh, uh, political involvement and uh, and success. So I commend that as a a local model for those in New York who are despairing, who are despairing about the um, uh, participation and the success of Asians in elective office. It can be done. It can be done. Has been done, and will continue to be done. Absolutely, it can be done. You know, but when you even when you look at Brooklyn, right? No one in city council, no one in the assembly, no one in the Senate. Um, but yes, Queens is definitely the model, right? And and Manhattan has some elected officials too. Um, Pam, you looked like you were going to respond. Uh, no, I actually want to ask um, uh, Randall a question, which is, um, and Neil, I think, was rightly saying that maybe Sabini or Abini or one of these groups, you might need to do more to help candidates. But in some ways, I think they're reluctant because they're a, they're apolitical organizations, right? They don't back particular candidates. So who who does one go to when you actually want to run for office? Like, what's the equivalent of a bar association, an affinity bar association, when you're trying to run to become the next Congress you know, woman from Queens? That is a uh, is a question that uh, doesn't have a single answer, but I found that um, people involved in the community, community organizers, 
seem to have some success in gaining the recognition that is necessary. Uh, some persons have come from uh, uh, other um, other circles, uh, successful business people, for example, in Queens, have been elected to um, uh, the council and to the assembly, but they, they had their base uh, in, um, in chambers of commerce, in other organizations that uh, aggregated and articulated uh, the issues that, that were important, and they had name recognition. So uh, that, is, that is what you do as far as, um, uh, as political Recognition, of course, uh, political recognition involves uh, donations, it involves uh, supporting um, uh, candidates uh, who are already in office. Uh, there's a whole process. I, I would be very happy to share my experiences with anyone who, um, who wants to uh, inquire. I'm very happy to speak with them. And now that I'm a civilian, I can say whatever I want. And it's very liberating in that regard. It's very it liberating is. to be able to speak uh, freely and write freely. So I would like to speak for a few minutes about your experience with judicial screening panels and whether you think diversity matters in a screening panel. Toko, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, diversity issues in screening panels uh, specifically. Um, my experience with judicial screening panels is uh, somewhat limited. It was really with the New York City bar uh, after I was appointed. Uh, but something happened recently that um, I, I found very, very concerning. And I think it goes to the issue of the administration of justice. Um, there was a recent finding by the New York Academy of Trial Lawyers who uh, reviewed uh, 14 candidates uh, for the Court of Appeals positions, two positions. And they found um, three of them not qualified, uh, gave them the lowest rating. Um, and two of them were current and former prosecutors. One, the third person was an Asian American woman, right? And she is somebody who is eminently qualified and considered uh, a real pillar in the Asian American community. Uh, what upset me was the fact that um, there was only one out of, um, I don't know, 30 uh, officers and board members of this association um, that was Asian. And I think that they never even considered her being, they never even considered diversity uh, issues in terms of the rating. I think that there's a whole issue of invisibility. And um, unless we speak out in some way about this in terms of you know the process that occurs, like who are these groups, these associations making these decisions, right? What, what is the composition of their um, associations? What are the standards that they're using? Are they taking diversity into consideration at all? I think that these are all legitimate questions to raise. And I think back to um, the Biden administration this year in February, making a decision not to have the American Bar Association, right, uh, vetting um, potential uh, uh, potential nominees, right, uh, for the judiciary, for the federal judiciary. So I think that that puts it um, really on the table in terms of us starting to ask the same questions. And when it comes to uh, judicial diverse, uh, when it comes to diversity issues, um, it is really important to start taking a look at it. Uh, there's also um, what I was referring to before, I'm sorry, it was the New York State Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. And then I also know that the New York Academy of Trial Lawyers uh, came out with the same uh, recommendation. And um, I believe there uh, they have no um, Asian members on their board. So that is an issue to me. So, so I've had um, extensive experience uh, going before screening panels um, and the way uh, screening panels work for civil court, there are two kinds, district seat, countywide seats, 
And the only civil court panel I never came out of, ironically, was the seat that that my my former judge held, and she asked me to uh, uh, to, uh, to to run for that seat. So you have to come out of the screening panel. And I mean, the questions I got were so um, not hostile, but but just every little negative thing they could find. That's all they they they, they talked about. And I thought, and I walked out of there thinking, well, I guess you know, I just this is it. I'm not qualified. But I happened also the same year there was a county panel, and I went into the county panel. And I came out of the county panel, and and that sort of got me going down the road and becoming a judge. And 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 there was such a difference, because the county panel, the, the county took the time to make sure that the that that the panel was the the panel was diverse. It was made up of of you know lawyers, community members, um, and and I had it was a really different experience. And that's what I've noticed. One thing, so so diversity really matters in screening panels. And when I spoke to Sabni for the first time. Uh, many years ago, it was me and and another a person who was a housing court judge, and I think we were the only South Asians at that time on the bench. And so when they asked me about it, and I and I said what my response to Sabni was that if that if they want um, a voice, they need to have people on screening panels. And and in fact, next year when I went into a Supreme Court screening panel, sure enough, Sabni had a voice on that panel, and it's kind of and it was a nice feeling for me. Um, to know that 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 I sort of achieved something of, of opening up that door, and I'm sure, or I hope, since then, that there's more of that representation. I, I know the Asian Bar does the same thing, and, and the other uh, uh, bar associations need to do the same thing. And, and a lot of ways it works. A lot of times people don't want to do the job because it's a lot of work if you do it properly. Uh, so so there is opportunity, um, but but you have to let the county leaders know and, and the appropriate people to be able to get on those kinds of panels. Can I ask a question since I know nothing at all about screening panels? Who is it that decides who gets on them? The county the, the, the county commit that's the county leaders essentially control the screening panels. So so they'll have so a judiciary chair and they'll send out notices to you know legal aid society, community groups uh, and okay. and the, They'll send members, and there are rules in terms of who can serve on it. I was asked to serve on a screening panel when I was a law clerk. I can't, I can't do that uh, because uh, I, I'm, I'm part of the judiciary. But uh, you know, it's 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 a very very important role these folks have because uh, they will select uh, three candidates as most highly qualified, and one of those three candidates is going to get. The, the seat in the primary. In New York City, if, if it's a dem Democratic primary, you're pretty sure that, that, that you're going to get through that process. And I imagine the second department, uh, Judge Ang, works the same way. Uh, yes, it does, if I may. And um, I took matters into my own hands because as presiding justice, I got to appoint uh, several persons to the mayor's committee on the judiciary and the governor's screening panel. And I can assure you that I made certain that there were Asians appointed to those panels. But again, that's a matter of taking matters into your own hands. <laughs> and I, I could tell that uh, uh, it was not diverse enough and that there wasn't a seat at the table for Asians. There were in my administration. I had five years uh, in the position and I made certain that those appointments were there. And uh, Judge Singh is right. Uh, it varies from, um, from county to county. Uh, you know, Queens has a different system uh, regarding screening panels. And yet um, it is, although it should not necessarily be still in the hands of the party leadership. They like to have the imprimatur of screening panels, but they uh, they nominate uh, who they wish. And uh, again, it's um, the only game in town. Uh, regarding the Supreme Court, we still have the judicial convention system, which uh, is an anachronism that has been upheld and sustained. Again, it is the only game in town. So recognizing that, you have to um, achieve your goal by by being involved in the process. So I, I believe that in the county of Brooklyn, it's only been in recent years that the Asian American Bar Association of New York has had a seat at the table. So I think years back, 
Um, well, years back, they didn't have a seat at the table, uh, but when they did start uh, being a part of the judicial screening process for the elective process, I think that Albany was only there maybe on rotating years and rotating with other minority bar associations, maybe every other year. But now over the last few years, uh, Albany has consistently had a representative at the table, right? So, and that is really critically important. But, um, you know, what Anil is saying is right. I mean, you have to have people willing to serve because it is volunteer and it is a lot of work and um, it's vetting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of applications, right? And then sitting through all of the screening interviews. So, but it is really critically important to have diversity on those, on all of those screening panels. So, um, all right, we are almost coming near the end of our uh, our panel. Do we have any final words of advice for uh, our audience, people who are aspiring to be judges? So my advice is pretty simple. Um, it's basically do what you love for as long as you can and do it well. Uh, don't try to curate or sculpt your career around some notion that you want to be a judge. I think that would be a big mistake because I think most judges would tell you, and certainly all the federal judges I know would tell you, that becoming a judge is, is uh, has to be, as I said before, a confluence of events falling in, into place at the same time. The stars have to align because there's so many things that are out of your control, political and otherwise. Uh, so the key is, you shouldn't plan your life around becoming a judge. And if it, if it turns out that there's that opportunity, though, you should seize it. And uh, you should not be afraid to ask for it and not be afraid to say that you're worthy of, of doing it. Um, but just do your job well wherever you are and try to enjoy it. As a colleague of mine said, his mother told him that if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And I think it's very good advice, ultimately. Um, so. I think accept serendipity, but don't, you know, and don't be too rigid about your plan. Anil? Um, I think the word I use is passionate. So, so I think it's, it's to be passionate about what you do um, professionally. Uh, and so my example is I get up every morning and I can't wait to do my work. I mean, I, I, I love my job. I, I you know, and, 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 and that's, um, um, if you are passionate about your career, um, I really do think, and you know, I, I, obviously what, what, what Pam is saying is right, you gotta do your job well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but I think with passion, you can make your dreams, whatever your dreams are, a reality, whether you wanna be a partner in a major law firm or, 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 or run your own law firm or be a judge. Toko? I really don't have anything new to uh, add to that. Um, you know, I think that what happens is, um, you know, if you look back at your own career in hindsight, then it looks like there's a linear path, right, that has been taken because everything kind of falls into place and it makes sense. But when you're living it, um, that's not necessarily the case. So, you know, passion is really important. I think that amongst the three of us, it's very obvious that um, we take great uh, pride and enjoyment um, in our work. And I think that there would probably be, you know, some uh, competitiveness in terms of who loves their job the most, right? But uh, that is absolutely key in terms of being able to enjoy the work that you're doing. Um, and then finding your path and your way right from that. Um, in terms of aspirations to be a judge, uh, I do agree with Pam that, you know, if you set your goal to be a judge, um, it might not always work the way you want it to. So, you know, um, it's probably very important to keep a lot of options um, at hand and just be flexible, right? To be open and flexible about uh, the work that you're doing. So that's my take on it. Thank you. I, I did just have one last question for our panelists. Um, do 
you have any Asian Pacific American mentors and do you think that it is important to have mentors? You know, it's funny. I have to confess, and maybe it's part of my personal personality flaw. I've never really sought out mentors. And I know that sounds odd. I mean, I do observe what people do and I try to think, oh, that's a good thing. That's not a good thing. But I'm too embarrassed to actually try to uh, ask too much of people and burden, feel like I'm burdening them. But obviously someone who I consider a role model is, is Denny Chin. And in along the way, he, I, I've sort of, you know, f literally followed in his footsteps. He, he was the, you know, the chair of the Sotomayor board and I and I filled in for that. He was the treasurer of the Nepaba and JC. I filled in after that. So I feel like I just trail around after him. But I mean, it's more that I observe people by example and he's certainly a role model in that regard. Um, but I, I, I don't know if I ever had a quote unquote mentor because I'm too embarrassed to ask for anyone <laughs> to serve in that position. <laughs> so I'm not a good person to ask about that. And I'm a terrible networker. So my, you know, at least the good news for all of you. You can't be too bad. Too <laughs> no, I'm awful. I'm pretty awful. So I'm awful at networking and I'm not good at asking for help and I'm not good at seeking out mentors. So like you should ask everybody else. <laughs> Anybody else want to comment on that? My, my mentor was uh, my uh, the judge I worked for yeah. uh, Schlesinger. I mean, and she was she's, she is a great woman, and and you know, and I, I worked for her for many years, and uh, and I sort of I think I learned the trade just watching and taking part in it, and uh, you know, and then she's the one who opened up the political process for me, as much as a judge can do, which is not much, because ultimately all she's doing is handing you a baton, and you have to carry it. Okay. All right. So uh, why don't we pull up the photographs of Judge Ang? I think those were a real treat. Yes, thank you. The first photograph over here shows me with a splendid head of hair, which uh, time has taken its toll of. But um, what we have here is a sketch made by Ida Liddy Dengrove of uh, WNBC News. Uh, in the 1970s, I think it was 1976, 1977, I, I tried one of the first uh, terrorism cases in uh, in the courts. That was William Morales. He was the um, the FALN bomber. The um, uh, the person behind me in the sketch is an attorney named Cunningham, and um, and we tried his case in, in Queen Supreme Court. The next one, please. All right, I uh, was a fairly new criminal court judge there, and the uh, person in the foreground is Mark Gastineau. And for those of you who are fans of the New York Jets, you might recall that he was a, uh, a prominent football player for that team, and he was being arraigned before me. Uh, and I don't remember what the offense was, but uh, as you can see, we were giving each other some hard looks so um, that is what that's about. That's a criminal court judge Eng and football player Mark Gastineau. The next one, please. Ah, this is <laughs> from the, the Daily News. And we have Mayor Koch uh, swearing me in as a criminal court judge. That's my mom who is uh, holding the Bible. At that time I was single. My mom is still uh, with us at age 98. But you can see the um, the lead in the New York Daily News piece, Ed Taps Chinese for Court. This is 1983. I don't know if today the editors would um, uh, allow that to be printed, but that is um, that was their take on it, the Chinese judge. And is there another one? Or is that it? Ah, here we go. Uh, I am in the uh, uniform of... Um, the New York Army National Guard, a reserve component of the Army. And uh, I was the state judge advocate at that time, the, um, the ranking officer uh, of the legal corps. And in that picture, I am something like uh, age 48 and a colonel. And that's uh, our firstborn, Laura, who is now a law student. And uh, it's interesting that uh, I've done my career backward because I was a judge before I was a father. So there we are. And um, what I do commend for everyone's attention is that 
you have to be patient, you have to have perseverance, and um, it will all come to pass, and hopefully successfully. So I did my life in reverse order, but uh, it got done. And that brings us up to the very last minute of the program. So congratulations, Judge Juan, for running a program that went to the minute. Yes, we said that it's until 8 o'clock and it's 7.58. So in closing, I just want to thank the Historical Society of the New York Courts for making this program possible. Thank you also to our law firm sponsor, Meyer Swazi English and Klein PC. And thank you to our three fabulous panelists thank you for spending two hours to engage with this in very important discussion and thank you to our audience for joining us i'm sure that everybody is totally zoomed out at this point so thank you to our audience for sticking with us for the last two hours so uh and thank thank everybody for their time so everybody stay safe and have a wonderful evening be well, Thanks. everyone. Bye-bye.